I don't read. I don't need to write no novel. I don't need to write no play. All I got to do is show you what the jihadis do every day. Any fool can see it. Anyone sane would know. When jihadis read the Quran, something's gonna blow. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week in jihad. This is the great David Wood with me, and I am Robert Spencer, author of the Quran. We are here yet again to tell you the news that the establishment media refuses to tell you and that the political elites hope you do not know. So this is a number one subversive act you are participating in tonight. Don't tell YouTube. In the meantime, welcome David. How are you this evening? Uh-oh. There's no sound on David. Wait a minute. What's wrong? Goodness, what's happening, ladies and gentlemen? There's no David sound. What do you think that could be? What what does one do when the guest has no sound? Oh, I think I see the problem. I see it. How about now, David? Nope, that doesn't do it. Huh. Well, this is embarrassing, ladies and gentlemen. Let's see. David, are you here? David's not on screen, I'm seeing. David, how about now? What on earth do you think is the problem, ladies and gentlemen? Anybody got any ideas? The gin could be the gin. Um, hmm. Well, yeah, David seems to be here, but people are saying he's not on screen, and I can't hear him. Hmm. Well, you know, I did an update. David, how about now? No. I did an update on this program, and this is what I get. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. Uh, I have no idea what's up here. Um, oh, there you go. Oh, I, I hit some button. I don't know. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. Anybody still here? Let's Tech hope. genius Robert Spencer. <laughs> that was probably my fault. I have no idea what uh, was wrong, but when I actually came in this evening, there was a screen up that I hadn't seen before, and I got rid of it, and I must have hit something wrong. Anyway, hi, David. Welcome. Hello. Back to the poetry. Well, the poetry um, is done. I think we, we've gotten that part of our program out of the way. And now, shall we go on? Uh, let's see. i got quite a few stories regarding women this week. One of them was an interesting story because AFP, Agence France, France Presse, the French news agency, AFP, they uh, say... They ran a story, a weepy story, about how universities have opened in Afghanistan, but it should stop us from learning. But then the very next paragraph, David, says the Taliban government imposed the ban after accusing women students of ignoring a strict dress code and a requirement to be accompanied by a male relative to and from campus. Oh, where'd he go? David, how are you? David, can you hear me? 
There's no sound again? Well, this is a fiasco. Ladies and gentlemen, you ever had a total fiasco? That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about a major disaster. We're on time and not even here. David looks fine, but apparently cannot be heard. Can, David, can you, can you hear me? Now, I, I haven't changed anything since you were here before, so why can't we hear you? You not hear me at all? Now I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, this is yeah, I hear you. I don't know what I don't know what's going on. It's the gin. <sighs> yep, my my internet connect says it's blazing fast, so something in between us is uh causing a problem. But uh yeah, if for some reason I fade out, just roll with it. Looks like I'm back in uh here and there, so. Well, David, you know that my connection is not so good out here in the sticks and uh we'll do what we can meanwhile do you still have that number for gin problems from detroit yeah that was in dearborn it was uh gin busters it was a, it was a real thing it's a <laughs> buster signs you got a problem with gin you uh you call these guys up and they I mean, they're actually like a group of muslim ghostbusters who show up and bust gin for you fantastic uh, if you can get me that number, maybe we can solve these problems. But in the meantime, what I was asking you was uh, Afghanistan. The Tal the, the their people saying this is what they're doing is un-Islamic. Taliban, meanwhile, is saying, wait a minute, you can't go out without a male guardian, and that's why you're barred from university. Now, is this male guardian business, does that have anything to do with Islam? Or are they misunderstanding the religion of peace and gender equality? Yeah, see, I mean, Muhammad laid down everything as completely equal. Um, so men can marry four wives. Wives can obviously marry four husbands. Um, I can beat his wife, can obviously beat her husband. Um, so, yeah, it's complete equality. But people mis misunderstand the religion. You know that. Yeah, all the time. So in any case, the point being that unfortunately the Taliban does indeed have an Islamic basis for what it's doing. I'm not saying it's the only understanding of the teachings on the education of women, but to just dismiss what they're doing as un-Islamic is not only naive, but fosters complacency. Meanwhile, in the Islamic Republic of Iran, we talked about this last week, David, there are more and more poisonings. There have now been more than 80 girls' schools targeted in chemical attacks. Many girls have been hospitalized. Many have been sickened. And so it seems as if in Iran, as well as in Afghanistan, among communities overwhelmingly Muslim, Muslims are getting this misunderstanding that women should not be educated and are targeting girls' schools. Now, that's strange if it's completely un-Islamic. It's even stranger in light of the fact that in the Islamic Republic of Iran, it doesn't seem to have, at least as far as we know, and of course what we know is sketchy, but it seems as if it's not based, it's not being done by the government, although the government certainly approves of it because it's punishing these girls who were protesting against the hijab, but it seems to be Islamic groups that are against female education. And it, the, the the super weird thing is that it, it doesn't seem to be a Sunni or Shia thing. Right? Yes. It's not it's not some weird Sunni or Shia thing. You've got Sunnis and Shias both thinking, hey, we've got a problem with these girls. We need to block their education. Um, and if all else fails, just start killing or poisoning girls in school. And I mean, ta Taliban's doing been doing that for a while, gunning down, you know, blowing up schools and gunning down girls outside schools and stuff like that. And uh, around now poisoning them, but uh, it, it got to be something strange about an ideology that says, uh, hey, when anything else goes wrong, just start attacking schoolgirls. Yeah, the, some of the most vulnerable people in any community, young girls, and this is who they're targeting. But of course, the Islamic Republic wants to sow terror in the hearts of the uh, enemies of Allah, as the Quran directs in chapter 8, verse 60, and consequently. They want to terrorize these girls, that being 
the most effective way to terrorize the entire opposition. So in another news item, we have a girl who has multicolored hair. And her name is Armita Abbasi. And she has, in a certain way, become a uh, symbol of the Iranian resistance. And it is in light of her multicolored hair that she is wearing without, of course, wearing a hijab in public. And she has been tortured and sexually assaulted in prison. Same reasons. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. in Germany, strange case out of Germany, David, a 73-year-old woman was robbed and in the course of the robbery raped by a Muslim migrant from Libya. Now, why on earth would he do something like that? Um, I don't know. One of life's great mysteries. <laughs> because, because there's obviously justification for anything like that in Islam's most trusted sources. Yeah, not a, not a bit of it. Um, the idea of raping a 73-year-old woman, the idea of raping anyone is repulsive and repugnant. But raping a 73-year-old woman, it's a whole other thing because the whole idea is, once again, to strike terror, not only in the woman, but in the people around her, in the infidels in general, uh, and to show that Islam dominates and does not have any respect for the mores of the infidels who are the most vile of created beings meanwhile in the uk yes david oh yeah i just wanted to uh you know it's good to keep a running tally of the things we learn about uh islam so we've got in multiple countries if anything goes wrong start attack school girls uh, poisoning them, shooting them, blowing them up, whatever you have to do, but just start going after schoolgirls until everyone is so freaked out that they'll they'll stop what they're doing. Um, and then elsewhere, it's uh, rape old ladies. If all else fails, mm -hmm. got to send a message and do so. You do so by raping old ladies. Notice, you know, you got the grooming gang, so you got rape old ladies, rape young girls, rape everyone. Just keep raping and uh, poisoning and blow schoolgirls so far that, that's that's what we that's what we know about the ideology so far just from the first few minutes of this week and now i got another one in the same vein i'm afraid and that is uh coming out of the uk muhammad tarus khan allegedly uh, he he's on trial actually so it's the allegations are being investigated as we speak he uh stabbed his niece, Somaya Begum, to death with a metal spike. Uh, she had been forced, or her father, Mohammed Tarus Khan's brother, had tried to force her to marry her cousin, and she had refused. So the uncle, Mohammed Tarus Khan, murdered her, stabbed her with this 11-centimeter-long Bradal tool, which is a sharpened metal woodwork implement. And then he put her in a garbage bag and took her out, uh, threw her in a dump, said that uh, he was questioned. He, asked, he, he was asked what he was doing, and he said he had some garbage and was disposing of it. But it was actually the body of his 20-year-old niece who had refused the arranged marriage. Now, what is that? What would lead an uncle to behave in such a way toward his beloved niece? Uh, notice how many insanely creepy things you've got going on there. You've got the one marrying, uh, you got to marry your cousin. Two, you got the uh, uh, arranged marriage, and you have to agree to it. And then three, of course, you've got this idea that if you are not doing what you're told, you're bad, you're un-Islamic, and therefore we'll put you in the un-Muslim category and just go ahead and kill you. And like, like any one of, I mean, if this only happened once, Robert, I think we could say, oh, maybe that was a fluke. But since 
this keeps happening over and over and over again, any one of those things should be raising red flags. Any one of those. If you just find out, uh, you know, the prevalence of cousin marriage, that should be raising some some flags. Um, if you find out about, you know, the, these these, you know, forced marriages, that should be raising some flags. And if you find out, oh, anytime this girl says, no, I don't want to marry my cousin uh, and they have to kill her, you might want to be looking into the ideology. But that would be Islamophobic. So we'll just keep letting it happen forever, apparently. Yes. Also, David, I do want to point out because people say, well, honor killing has nothing to do with Islam, nothing to do with anything but the cultures of the people involved and so on. And, you know, uh, there's some there's so much deception out there on these matters. And so uh, it's worthwhile to note in the first place that, as I said, actually, last week, chapter 18 of the Quran has uh, Hidr, the companion of Moses, not named in the Quran, the strange, mysterious person with whom Moses travels for a while in chapter 18 of the Quran. He kills a boy, apparently gratuitously, and then he says, and as for the boy, his parents were believers, and we feared that he would overburden them by transgression and disbelief. So we intended that their Lord should substitute for them one better than him, in purity and nearer to mercy. So there you are in the Quran, you have the example of a child being killed for being non-religious, non-Islamic, as a reward for the parents, or as a something so that the parents can have a better child. Also, Islamic law stipulates, according to the Sunni, the Shafi'i manual, Reliance of the Traveler, retaliation is obligatory against anyone who kills a human being purely intentionally and without right. However, not subject to retaliation is a father or mother for killing their offspring or offspring's offspring. Not only that, but the Palestinian Authority, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, are just some of the states that actually have reduced legal penalties for honor killing. If you kill someone, then you suffer various penalties. But if you kill someone and can prove it was to cleanse the honor of your family, you'll get off much more lightly. And uh, as 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 uh, as I've pointed out here, um, time and again, because these stories keep coming up. Um. Yeah, you can have you can have honor killing as a cultural practice. Um, you can always have men who will kill their daughters and so on for getting out of line, but it's easy to justify in Islam, as you've as you've just pointed out, which is why it continues, which is why other cultures have gotten rid of it over time, and uh, it still persists in Islam, and it's that uh, the the Idea, notice it's a, it's the same principle that hey uh, your daughter has gotten out of line or your sister or someone in your family has gotten out of line and therefore your family is dishonored how can you restore that honor well by by killing the person who did it and that somehow restores your honor um, but in, in Islam you've got passages like Surah four verse sixty five which say that if you don't submit to everything that Muhammad says you're not a real Muslim and then you've got the death penalty for apostasy. And then you've got Muhammad commanding in Sunan Ibn Majah to carry out the penalties of Allah, even against your own family members. And so you put those together. Oh, my daughter's getting out of line or my niece is getting out of line. She's getting out of line. She's, she doesn't really care about Islam. OK, so she's actually an apostate, according to Surah 4, verse 65. What do we apostates? We killed them. Uh, oh, but she's a family member. Yeah, Allah orders you to. I mean, Muhammad orders you to carry out the penalties against your own family members. And uh, so you put it all together and you've got a cultural practice now that's not going to go away because now it's sanctioned by Allah himself. Indeed. Uh, people, uh, there's a lady, Christian Hijab, in the comments asking, where is that passage from the Quran that I uh, noted about the person, the boy being killed by Moses' companion for not being pious? That's uh, chapter 18, verses 80 and 81. Anyway, also in France, David, always a rich vein, we have Abdoulaye D, who is 53 years old, and he lured girls ages 9 and 11 to his home, ages 9 to 11, rather, to his home, said he had a guinea pig. 
that uh, he wanted to show them, and they were interested. And then he ended up sexually assaulting these children who were between 9 and 11. He's also suspected of raping a 14-year-old girl. When he was arrested, Abdullahi said he was teaching the girls the Quran. Well, in a way, he was. <laughs> but surely the Quran does not allow such behavior, David. Surely it does. <laughs> um, so you, you've got all kinds of practices there. So you've got, you know, Surah 65, verse 4, which justifies um, marrying, having sex with, and divorcing prepubescent girls. So girls all before they've reached the age of puberty. And then, of course, you've got all these, you know, passages about um, taking the unbelievers, the unbelieving uh, girls as your sex slaves and so on. And so it's, it's just you, you jumble this all together and it's just, hey, I can I can kind of do what I want against uh, these other people. Indeed. And, uh, pretty sick. All right. So that is our stories about women uh, for this week. We've got quite a lot of jihad of other kinds as well. Also in France, David, a uh, Muslim produced a hammer and brandished it in front of a passerby, threatening him, threatening her rather, and then uh, three policemen showed up and he threatened to kill them, said he wanted to die a martyr. He was screaming a certain phrase all the while and i was wondering if you might be interested in hazarding a guess as to what this phrase might be uh it's either peace and love or allahu akbar david you're right it's 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 peace and love that he was screaming no he was he was seriously screaming allahu akbar and he was sentenced to two years in prison. Not only that, but he has 25 prior convictions. So here's a guy, he's got 25 prior convictions. He's got a knife, a hammer rather, and he's screaming Allahu Akbar. He's saying he wants to die a martyr and he gets two years. That's France, 2023. Uh, of course they... Of course, they gave him two years. They couldn't find a motive. That's right. You know, <laughs> you're, you're kidding. But let's skip over to Sweden for a minute. In Sweden, we had a Muslim who was also screaming a certain phrase. Do you think, what do you think, David? What, what phrase might he have been screaming? I'm going to stick with the, the, the classic option of uh, either peace and love or uh, Allahu Akbar. Once again, oddly enough, it was Allahu Akbar, an amazing coincidence here, and we have 10-year-old girl he stabbed in the stomach. And sure enough, the news story out of Samnit says, Samnit is a Swedish newspaper, says the reason for the assault is still unclear. Now, you would think that they would be able to tell from that Allahu Akbar cry, but no. In France, once can't, again, yes? Can't trust reality. Well, you know, these guys, when they say that the motive's unclear, it's because they don't know anything about jihad. They don't even recognize that there is a, such a thing as jihad. They don't believe it exists. And consequently, they have to say they don't know what the motive is or the guy's mentally ill because they simply have no other explanation. They've already ruled reality out. It's as if you were in World War II and you said, well, the one thing we know is that there are no Nazis who are... Nazis are peaceful and tolerant, and so there are no Nazis invading Poland. And so when the Nazis invade Poland, you have to think, well, these people must all be mentally ill, or they must all be something else, but they're not Nazis invading Poland because of National Socialism. That doesn't exist. And 
yeah, I mean, they forced themselves into, into thinking this because once you've once you've ruled out Islam as a source of the problem, it has to be something else. It absolutely has to be, even if the person going on the killing spree doesn't realize what the real issue is, even if he thinks he's doing it for us, it, it has to be something else because it can't be the religion of peace. Yes. And therefore, even if some, even if someone is quoting chapter and verse of passages which are ordering him to do this, it has to be something else. And that's why they, they have to continue searching for a motive, no matter what the person says. It, it, it can't possibly be what he's saying. It must have been you know, uh, climate change, or it must be uh, his economic situation. It has to be something else. It must be the West disrespecting his his country. Or it has to be something else. It has to be. Indeed. Also in France, we have yet another, an individual uh, who is screaming. What is he screaming, you think? Uh, I'll just I'll just go with Allahu Akbar. Well, you know, it's certainly, uh, I, I, I have to suggest maybe, you know, they could do a little more work on these stories. But in any case, yeah, it is Allahu Akbar. And the guy is screaming Allahu Akbar. And he attacks police officers. And he has been, he's Tunisian, and he's been ruled schizophrenic. Because that is another fallback for these people who have no jihad. They have no explanation. They do not believe jihad exists. So he must be crazy. That certainly makes sense. That does make sense. Okay. You've convinced uh, you've convinced you've convinced me, Robert. That's it. That's it. So now you're gonna start saying they're all these guys are all crazy. So David, over mm -hmm. in Bangladesh, there were it was prayer time last Friday for uh, Muslims in the Panchagar district in the Rangpur division of Bangladesh. And outside the prayers, the Ahmadiyyas of the local area, the Ahmadiyya community was announcing plans to hold a three-day religious program. And the Muslims, the Sunnis, came out of the mosques and attacked the Ahmadiyya, torching houses and vandalizing properties. Now, what I wanted to ask you is, this: they came out of prayers. Didn't they, weren't they just hearing in prayers all about how Islam is peace and that they should be tolerant? So why would they go out and attack these Ahmadis when they had just heard all about the peacefulness of Islam. Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing the sermon was about Surah 9, verse 73, where Allah ordered Muhammad to fight, to wage jihad, not only against unbelievers, but also against hypocrites, uh, which provides the justification for fighting people who have the wrong Islamic beliefs. Um, so yeah, must have must have skipped over the uh, be peaceful and tolerant towards all people, no matter their beliefs, and uh, just accidentally blurted out the nine seventy three part. Indeed, you, you know it's wild. It's like, I mean, Ahmadis in in the West are some of the main defenders of Islam. Yes. Like, uh, hey, we, you know, hey, stop criticizing Islam. Stop criticizing Islam. It's like, my goodness, they're slaughtering you in the name of Islam too. <laughs> they're so. That they'll they'll slaughter they'll slaughter Ahmadis as quickly, if not more quickly, than they'll slaughter like Christians or some other group. And so, I mean, Ahmadis are the, are on the receiving end of this, and they're they're defending it. They're defending. They're defending the ideology that's getting them killed. Very strange. But again, I mean, almost everyone in the West is doing the same thing. So, I do find it completely baffling. Uh, I've had so many deeply unpleasant encounters with. Ahmadi spokesman in the West, and they, they're, you know, they have this slogan, love for all and hate, hate for none, and they're some of the most hateful people I've ever encountered, and yeah. they are being violently persecuted by Sunnis in Pakistan, and then they turn around and side with the same groups in the United States. It's, it's extraordinarily strange. 
very, very, very strange. It's like, hey, if you really believe what you're saying about Islam being peaceful, why don't you go tell all the guys who are slaughtering you in the name of Allah? Tell them. Indeed. Tell, tell, tell that we're not, we're not slaughtering you. We're not killing anyone. Why are you focused on us? At least we're trying to do something about the ideology that's getting you killed. You aren't. Indeed. Weird stuff. It's You're very defending weird. it. <laughs> Over in India, same thing in a similar story as the last one. Uh, Muslims gathered after prayers to throw stones and Molotov cocktails at Hindus. And so here again, you have the prayers... And instead of learning all about peace and tolerance, somehow the prayers just got them all stirred up. Meanwhile, in France, there is a strange story of an unidentified person who's only been called a thin man of African type who has vandalized now two churches in Paris. Now, I don't know. This guy may not be a Muslim at all because Africa is full of people of all kinds of religions. But would there be any reason why a Muslim might want to vandalize a church in more than one? Uh, yeah, and that's why it, we, we've, we've talked about this repeatedly as well. It's like when you hear news that a mosque has been blown up in Afghanistan. You've got Hindus in Afghanistan who've been uh, violently persecuted for a long time. You've got Christians in Pakistan who've been violently persecuted for a long time. So if you didn't know from experience that when mosques are being blown up, it's usually rival Muslim groups, you might think, oh no, shame on those Hindus or shame on those Christians. But we've just we've just learned over time. Yeah, it, it, in theory, the next one could be by a Christian or a Jew or something like that. Just, you know, experience tells us if you had to, if you had to, to go with your gut on one, you, you, we know, we know who tends to up mosques and we know who tends to be a, you know, going on a church desecration spree. Indeed. So, uh, I wouldn't rule that out. I'm not saying that's the, that's who did it, but I would, I, uh, wouldn't rule it out. Meanwhile, somebody in the comments was asking where in India did that take place where, uh, Muslims came out of the mosque and began to uh, throw stones and Molotov cocktails at, Hindi at, at, at Hindus. This was in Prayagraj, Uttar Pradesh. And it's a court case that's going on now. This happened actually last June. Okay, so we have in the UK, David... Interesting story out of Britain. Abdurrahman, Abdurrahman Mohammed Seni. And uh, he has been jailed for 28 months, which is an extraordinarily draconian sentence for Britain. Uh, what happened was he went to the Leeds City Council because he was angry that they had asked, he had asked them for money and they wouldn't give him cash. He just went in and said, give, give me whatever, 500 pounds. I know, pounds of what? And they sent him off. So he, uh, he, he went back and he tried to torch the building because he was angry about not being given handouts. Now, why on earth would he have the idea that the infidel government of Leeds owed him a living. Where would he get that? That's idea, the, I mean, David? I mean, th that's the the entire idea behind jizya is that people who are inferior to you need to pay you money, in acknowledging in acknowledgement of their inferior status, and if they don't, you just surprise them until they do, and there then they go. eventually pay you money to, and they eventually pay you money in order to avoid. The instability. And you know, you know, you know. It's crazy. You could probably get a bunch of these these guys and just say, "Okay, guys, we're gonna we're gonna pay you regularly, not to do all the stuff you're doing to us." I probably okay as long as you, as long as those checks are coming in, we'll uh, we'll be nice. Yep. Very much so. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, a Sufi. We got a Sufi, David, Pakistani Sufi leader Malana Dr. Muhammad Suleiman. 
And he has been caught on video saying, and I quote, Allah forgive me, these Sikhs are so dirty. We only have a beard. We will convert these Sikhs to Islam one day. We have a complete plan ready. Don't spread this, but we will convert Sikhs to Islam. I think it's being spread. Oopsie. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, why would he think Sikhs are dirty? Where would he get that idea? Um, I mean, I mean, I mean, Christians and Jews are we're people of the book, and we're called najis, right? That's Surah nine, verse twenty-eight. That's najis. It means we're filthy, we're disgusting. So, I mean, I mean, other groups are are worse than us. They're more disgusting than us. Yep. So there you go. Also in India, we have here, uh, what's this fellow's name? Bab Badruddin Ajmal. And he was addressing a public meeting not long ago. He says, after 20 years, India will be governed by boys and girls belonging to the Muslim community. Now, why would somebody say this, you know, when he's living in a pluralistic society and Islam is tolerant and peaceful? Why would he get the idea that it was necessary for him to affirm that within 20 years, India will be under Islamic rule? Um, I mean, the, the, the goal is always to violently subjugate the world. And uh, even though you have had Muslim rulers who tolerated Hindus at certain points in a manner, uh, treating them like like they're people of the book, uh, I mean, at, at the end, of, at the end of the day, it's it's Christians and Jews who have the opportunity to to remain, in theory at least, to remain Christians and Jews and not attacked as long as we're acknowledging our inferior status and paying jizya. But uh, Hindus, I mean, according to Islam, Hindus have no such protection, and so they are supposed to be, they are supposed to be given the option convert or die. Indeed. Okay. Shall we move on? We got a few stupid infidels this week, David. There's always stupid infidels. There are always stupid infidels, and there are always quite a lot of them in Britain. And so in Britain, hey, it's my pal Subdeacon Nectarios. Hello, Subdeacon Nectarios. Anyway, <laughs> there you have it. Um, Thanks for coming by. Good to see you. Anyway, uh, in Britain, we have the ongoing drama of Shamima Bagoom. Shamima Bagoom being the ISIS bride when she was, I believe it was 15 years old or 14 years old. She, is, she snuck out of Britain, went to join ISIS. She married several Islamic State fighters in succession after one by one they were killed. That uh, she participated in their atrocities. She has been barred from returning to Britain. She has appealed. She was refused again. She then tried her case in the media. The BBC, always obliging when it comes to jihadis, uh, uh, put up a 10 part podcast calling for her to be allowed to return to Britain. None of that worked. And so now. She has been, her cause, that is, has been taken up by Jonathan Hall, who is the reviewer of terrorism legislation for the British government. And he wants Shamima Begum to return to the UK. And the UK's Express newspaper says that she's in a vulnerable, posi vulnerable position as ISIS could attack the camp where she lives. Now, why is it, okay, J JD says, it's not Bagoom, it's Bagoom. We have to say it right, David, it's Bagoom. Shamima, Shamima Bagoom. And Shamima yeah, Bagoom, Shame. she wants to return to Britain. And, and, and you know, uh, I believe that she wants to return because she might have an ulterior motive. That couldn't possibly be the case now, could it? <laughs> no 
And and I mean, th think about it. I mean, so 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 people are worried that Al Qaeda might attack this camp. They're not going to be. They're not going to be targeting Jemima. They're they're gonna they're gonna. I mean, they're just gonna pick a, a husband for her. That's what they would do. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Especially if she's deceiving the uh, West and the media in regard to her true sentiments, then it's not going to bother them. It's only possible that she might be sincere in having renounced them, but they don't even care about that as long as she complies when they come around. Yeah, that's the point. I mean, e even if she's sincere, even if she's had a change of heart and she doesn't want to slaughter unbelievers in the name of Allah anymore, when 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 the bodies show up, she, she all she has to say is, "Yeah, I was just trying to trick them into getting back in there." And they go, oh, "Okay, here's your new husband." Yep, that's it. Just now, jihadi. jihadi. I, I just wanted to say to the jihadis who might take her as a wife, don't have any kids with her because they're all watching. Because it, it it really it really looks like it really looks like she keeps killing her kids. Um, she you had, think she so? had three kids. Yeah, that's. I mean, the, 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 the guy interviewed her who says you know he really had a lot of compassion for her and wants her to come back and so on. Uh, he he said it. He said he oh my. because all her all three she had three kids. They all mysteriously died from lack of oxygen. That's all that was reported. Lack of oxygen. Meaning there's not of enough air, which is mm. exactly what would happen. Put your hand over if you put your hand over a kid's mouth and close his nose up, right? So yeah, no other cause, no medical difficulties. Just oops, baby died from lack of oxygen. Oh goodness! Well, the story just keeps getting worse, David. And that's really the story of Britain in general. The story keeps getting worse. I should write a book about Britain called "The Story Keeps Getting Worse." Uh, this story, the next one we got is out of the, uh, ongoing drama of the damaged Quran in the school that we discussed last week. And, uh, mm -hmm. you'd be pleased to know, actually, that the fellow who damaged the Quran and left the smudge on page 246 and tore the cover slightly has actually been suspended. Some reports say he's actually been suspend expelled from the academy, from Kettlethorpe School. But there was another kid in the school who threatened to kill him. And he was not suspended or expelled. The police probably came... Gave him a, probably gave him a medal. They gave him words of advice. I kid you not. That's the story. Police have given words of advice to a boy who sent death threats to an autistic student who lightly damaged... A copy of the Quran. So the kid who lightly damaged the Quran accidentally is out of school, in hiding, got death threats, and the kid who gave him the death threats got a talking to, got words of advice. It's it, it's 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 to the point where, I mean, on the one hand, you you gotta feel bad for. The kids who go through this and the parents and so on. But on the other on the other hand, the, the people are the one who keep allowing the leaders to 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 do this nonsense, right? I mean, you, you would need you would need you would need one generation of British people to say we're not standing for this crap anymore, and it would be done. It'd be done. You wouldn't have to deal with it anymore. It's not complicated. Um, and I don't, I, you know, I'm not I'm not talking about like going through the streets and doing horrible stuff. I mean, just guys, we're not putting up, we're not putting up with this. If someone damages a Quran, uh, if you think it's deliberate and that that person has violated some rules, um, then clearly, uh, clearly explain that. And I'm going to say there should be rules against, you know, damaging a Quran because it could hurt people's feelings. By all means, tell us what we should think about your Quran when it says that, you know, Jews and Christians are the worst of creatures and that you have to violently subjugate us. Tell us about tell us about that and feelings, because if we're judging by feelings that we have to get rid of your book. Indeed. But the situation is very bad, as you know, in, in the UK, David. And so we have Home Secretary Suella Braverman. What is it? Braverman? Su Suella Braverman. Uh, and, and I believe she said 
that actually th there were blind spots in the system which have allowed certain Islamist groups to operate under our radar. And I think blind spots is a charitable way to put it. There's incredible willful blindness in the British system that has allowed Islamist groups to operate under the radar. And I don't really believe that Suella Braverman is going to fix the problem. I, I, I believe it's much deeper than even she realizes. And in line with that, we also have out of the UK, David, uh, the revelations that MI5, the spy service, had intelligence about Salman Abidi, the Manchester Jihad bomber who killed 22 people at an Ariana Grande concert in a few years back. Uh, and they had intelligence about him, but did not stop him. And so now it's come out that the attack might have been prevented, but the MI5 people did not act upon the intelligence. Now, why might they not have acted upon it? I, I don't know the specifics, but I would guess for the same reason they spent years not intervening as thousands of young British girls were groomed, drugged, raped, get raped and pimped I would, I would guess that just worried about being called names indeed it seems to be that the great civilization that the british once represented is going to die and its epitaph is going to be at least we weren't islamophobic um i i have to say though you know as much as think as bad as things look in the United States, as much as we look around and say, man, this sucks, everything that's going on, as far as how stupid people are getting, at least, at least we get to look at Great Britain and Canada and France and say, gosh, at least we're not off, not that bad off. Right? Well, that's true. But it's also kind of a signpost as to where we're heading. Yeah, like, 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 I, I actually sit here, I actually sit here thinking, like, this is going to sound weird, Robert, but years ago when jihadis were uh, sending me all kinds of death threats, they're going to murder me, they're going to murder my family, and people are saying, aren't you worried, David? I'd be like, no, they're going to, I mean, they'd kill Robert Spencer first. As long as he's still alive, I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty good to go. In other words... <laughs> well, they've tried twice. They just no, didn't, didn't succeed. Yeah, that's what I mean. So I'm looking at you thinking, uh, OK, w when he goes, then I can start then I can start, uh, you know, paying attention a little closer. But that's that's how it's like, you know, Great Britain and France and everything like eh, it'll be them first. And then when it happens to them, then we can point and say, see, we told you, we told yeah, you. That's certainly true. And there's also Sweden. Let's not forget Sweden. Uh, can't story, forget Sweden. Can't forget Sweden. 56 year old Khaled Anan is wanted in custody wanted in custody hmm i think i must have mistranslated that i don't know swedish i was working from google translate but apparently he's in custody for monday's knife attack against a police officer outside the police station in norrköping and he's uh interested it's interesting to note that this guy has been in uh, a hospital in a mental hospital since 2013 because he attacked police officers with gasoline in 2013 and he was declared insane and has been in a mental hospital ever since up until quite recently when a court decided that there was no longer a significant risk that he will relapse into serious crime as a result of the mental disorder. So they let him go. And the first thing he did was attack a cop with a knife. What do you think they might have missed here in dealing with this guy, David? I don't know. One, one of life's great mysteries again. Nothing is as mysterious as anything involving Islam. <laughs> it's incredible, really. I mean, yeah, you, have again, to, you have to complete... You have to completely turn off your your reasoning ability, your sense of reality. You have to turn it all off whenever whenever Islam is on the table. Indeed. 
because in this case, as in so many other cases, we have a guy who is probably a jihadi, but he's diagnosed as mentally ill because they don't have the jihadi category in Sweden. It doesn't exist. They have to call him something. So he goes and sits in a mental hospital for 10 years or almost 10 years. And then they say he's cured because he doesn't have any way to deal with, to, to go jihad in the mental hospital. As soon as he gets out, he reveals that he's a jihadi, which they should have known all along. But the category doesn't exist. Yeah, there's this... Uh... There's this concept of erring on the side of caution. Like, yeah. if you take a if you take a jihadi, if a jihadi wants to slaughter a bunch of people in the name of Allah, and you lock him up for a while, and he starts saying, "Hey, I'm fine, guys. See, I'm fine. I'm cured. You, that de-radicalization program really, really worked." Well, if the de-radicalization pro uh, uh, if that actually worked, if the de-radicalization program actually worked for once, then he's to say it worked. I'm fine now. Let me back into society. But if he still just wants to go on a killing spree, he's going to say the exact same thing. So the fact that the guy is acting normal or whatever does not tell you anything about what his intentions are. And yet they keep, oh, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. How about, how about erring on the side of the safety of the people that this guy basically wants to kill? Indeed. Those, that consideration does not enter in. But, 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 but by, the, by the way, it was, it was the exact same thing that should have been common sense all the way back with Rifka Barry when you got on tons of people's radar as the most evil person in, in America because you were saying, Hey, maybe it's not a good idea to send this girl back to her father who says he's going to kill her for becoming a Christian. Um, and it was like, ah, what if the girl is lying? Well, what if she's not lying, right? <laughs> it's, it's like, it, uh, okay, she, she could in theory be lying. She could in theory be telling the truth. If you don't know, seems like you would want to err on the side of not sending her back to her dad. And yet you had all the media, everyone, ah, send this girl back, give her back to her loving, loving dad. It's amazing, really, because under any other circumstances, in any other situation, nobody would have been saying, send that girl back. They would have said, she says her father wants to kill her, and there's probable cause for believing her, because Islam does teach this. But they couldn't admit that Islam really teaches that. And so they had to say, this is just a hysterical girl running away from home and she'll calm down and everything will be okay. And they were willing to risk her life for that proposition. Uh, the only thing that, yeah. the only reason why she didn't go home is because the clock ran out. She turned 18 while the uh, thing was all still tied up in the courts. And, and notice that, I mean, it, because they keep doing the same thing. They want to err on the side that has the potential to get a bunch of people killed. Mm -hmm. Like, hmm, we could do this or that. We could do this or that. This one, if we're wrong, gets a bunch of people killed. I know. Let's do that. It's like, what? You know, this reminds me, David. Uh, I've always, I'm always asking you, what did the guy scream? And he's always screaming, Allahu Akbar. A few years back, there was, for some reason, that caught the attention of the establishment media. There was some attack where the guy screamed, Allahu Akbar, that got a lot more attention than they usually do. And so CNN and the New York Times and one of the other ones, they all ran pieces about how Allahu Akbar is this beautiful cry of yeah, faith in that. God. Yeah. And the CNN one actually said, so if you are in a crowded public place and you hear someone yell Allahu Akbar, don't be alarmed. It's just somebody affirming his faith in Allah. And I thought, so you're asking these people to put their lives on the line. Because it very well could be a jihadi who's going to explode a bomb or some clown with a knife stabbing random people. And you're saying, don't be alarmed, don't run away, because it would be Islamophobic. Should, should have tested that theory. <coughs> wait, wait until that reporter, wait until that reporter was walking around and. 
Yeah, start started a phone start <clears throat> start a re start a phone recording, and then you'll ah what the and then uh, watch this person hit the deck. You liar! <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got a I got one in connection with that. Um, there's a big scandal in the European Union because it turns out that a large number of socialist politicians, many of whom are members of the European Parliament, are on the payroll of Qatar. And as such, they are voting for and sometimes even sponsoring legislation in terms of mass migration and other issues that favors Qatar and its allies. And Qatar, of course, being a center of the Muslim Brotherhood, this is a matter of some concern. But it also made me wonder if it's not just a hundred politicians, but also the media. And that would explain a lot in terms of why they are always on the side of jihad and endangering people. In connection with it. Anyway, one more out of uh, <clears throat> the Council on American Islamic Relations, our dear friends, they have launched a petition. We have talked about related things in regard to this before, where there is a very, very close alliance between the Western left and Islamic groups and groups that are even in favor of jihad violence. And now that alliance is breaking down. And it's because of, in Michigan, in this particular case, an LGBTQ rights bill. And the Council on American Islamic Relations is coming out against it. Now, I am not, by this mentioning this, I have to emphasize, I'm not in favor of this bill. I'm, I'm not talking about that at all. I am noting that the leftist Islamic alliance is breaking down over the left's increasingly radical vision of imposing its view of sexual morality or lack thereof on the rest of us. And that this is something that is giving some people on the right a lot of hope because they think, oh, now we'll ally with the Islamic groups. Why might that be a foolish hope, David? Um, any sort of alliances like this are, um, are temporary. Um, the, the only way, and it would come at a cost, right? It would be, Hey, we'll align with you, but you have to sort of control people speaking against it. You have to defend Muhammad. You have to defend the Quran as part of our agreement. And lots of people on the, on the, I mean, there, there, there are plenty of people on the right who would agree to that because they're more concerned about, you know, wokeism and lgbtq stuff so there are people who would love to align with muslims get muslims on their side um they they obviously don't know much about islam if they think that's a good long-term plan because at the end of the day there are multiple competing groups who want to control us who want complete control over us who want to control everything we say and so on so it just doesn't make a lot of sense to say hey, let's let's align with this group that wants to control us so we can uh, worry about this other group that wants to wants to control everyone um so it's uh it, it's a it's a rough situation it's, it's a rough situation rough situation in that there there are i've seen them there are, there are muslims who are saying hey we need to switch sides in this and form alliances uh for the sake of our kids um but well you've got an ideology that calls for a violent subjugation so count me out of any alliances you've got there indeed then this is what people really don't understand here again, because they, they don't study what Islam actually teaches. And there has been 20 years of propaganda now telling them that to study what Islam teaches and speak honestly about it is somehow wrong, Islamophobic, and uh, does not take full into full account or all the, does not take into account sufficiently the fact that there are some Muslims out there who are just genuinely nice guys. And of course there are, we all know them. Uh, what is that guy that faked being stabbed in San Diego? I'm sure he's a real barrel of laughs. I, I forget. Sh Shake Ibn, Shake Ibn, Ibn Ketchup. They call him, they call him Shake Ibn <laughs> Fibbin, Shake, Shake Ibn, uh, Ibn Ketchup. They call him a uh, Shake Ibn Smollett. Uh, they have all kinds of names for him. Yeah, see, he must be a big, he must be a barrel of laughs. Anyway, David, thank you. Apologies, folks, for the technical difficulties. Oh, 
Yes. Oh, what one thing? Uh, uh, right after this, I'll be over for anyone who's watching um, and want a discussion to continue. Uh, I am about to be over on the Apostate Prophets channel. We're going to be discussing a related topic, namely what an atheist YouTuber found out when he when he uh, unfortunately criticized Islam and on a Muhammad. And uh, obviously, he's going to be greeted with uh, peaceful calls. <laughs> not to do that but uh fascinating who's the atheist youtuber uh he goes by destiny uh, his name is destiny i don't know what his real oh, name I is oh i keep but, hearing uh, about destiny i don't know who this is oh you <laughs> might you might want to you might want to check out his twitter page because he's he's actually funny he's he's like he has the same personality type as you me and the apostate prophet namely that uh the threats the threats and insults tend tend to work with a lot of people but with some people they have the opposite effect and then like people start criticizing him so this guy's been just been when they started threatening him he just he just went off and started making fun of muhammad which is a oh, good okay. good approach well we'll Thumbs see how it works out anyway i don't know if you can see that but the apostate prophet is here says dude get off the stream you're supposed to go live with me now so without further ado ladies and gentlemen thank you if there's any jihad we'll be back next week God willing.